Just let them get off stage and then you can. What's the feedback coming from? Oh, that works too. Okay. Yeah. the place to start and I say hey what a wonderful kind of day where we can learn to work and play and get along with each other Batteries are gonna go dead. You toss me another battery. So, how many of you know that song? Just out of curiosity, some of y'all are singing along to it, which is awesome because you know I was too. Really, I didn't know it was dead. Okay, it, it was red lighting. So here we go. All right. So tonight I'm going to ruin your childhood show. Okay. I'm sorry, but it, it has. You're right, it has. They brought in some things that were bad. Anyway, you know, the last two months we've been talking about all these myths and scripture, and one of the two key points that were made in the song were believe in yourself and trust in your heart, or it comes from the heart. Now, a few weeks ago we talked about how, or how trusting in your heart was a bad thing, right? This week I'm going to destroy it even more because we're going to be talking about the myth of believing in yourself. So, we are not going to celebrate Arthur, even though you guys know the song. I used to like the show too, and then they did some things I didn't agree with. But the whole idea of believing in yourself, what this does is it puts us in a position to where we become self-sufficient, which means that we like to say that I don't need to depend on anyone, I can do this myself. Um, so we, we become isolated. You know, when you get your first job, you start thinking that you're the king or the queen of the world. You get that first paycheck, and then you see how much taxes come out, and you're like, wait, what happened? But wait till you get older. But the thing is, this idea of being self-sufficient has always been attractive to us because we no longer have to depend on our parents. How many of you would like to not have to depend on your parents for things? You know, those of you that can't drive, how many of you would like to be able to get in the car and say, I don't have to worry about my mom or dad driving me somewhere? Yeah, you want to be self-sufficient. We like the idea of not having to ask anyone for help. Now, there's a danger in this, and, and we'll kind of talk about this briefly, but whenever we become self-sufficient, Pride becomes an issue. And so then it gets to the point to where when we, when we find ourselves to be self-sufficient, to where we don't have to depend on anyone, we have the same expectation for everyone else. And so we can become apathetic or we can become callous to people that need help because we don't need help. And so we kind of live in this bubble that if we've got everything figured out, everyone else should too. But tonight we're going to be talking about believing in yourself. And the first thing we're going to talk about is how bad or how heavy of a burden it is. So we're going to be starting out in Genesis chapter 3, and we're going to look at the fall of man and woman. You know, We don't discriminate here. Um, so if you'll turn to Genesis chapter 3, and I'm going to read you the first five and a half verses. So let's get started. The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord had made. He was smarter, wily. One day he asked the woman, Did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any tree in the garden? Of course we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. God said, you must not eat it or touch it. If you do, you will die. 
You won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it, and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. Then it says the woman was convinced. So let me give you a recap here. Adam and Eve are in the garden. God tells them, hey, you can eat anything you want to. You just don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Seems like a pretty good gig, right? You know, a pig walks by, you can just grab a couple slices of bacon off of him. You can grab some fruit from here or there. You won't die because death didn't exist, so you can eat raw bacon. But then Satan comes into the picture as a serpent. He, it, the Bible describes him as the most cunning or wily creature there is. And so he starts having this conversation with Eve, and he gets her to be tempted. So she, sides, she ends up siding with Satan and says she's convinced. So she sides with Satan, she eats the fruit, then Adam eats the fruit. And because of their reaction, sin comes into the world. And because of what they've done, not only is it an issue for just the two of them, it's an issue for all of humanity and all of creation, essentially forever, until Christ comes back. And so their decision has impacted all of creation. It brought sin into the world. So then what happens after this is there's a discussion between God and Adam and Eve and the serpent, and he gives them the consequences of their actions. So, let me break this down. Satan appealed to Eve's flesh by arguing against what God said and by twisting his words. So Satan challenges God's characteristics. First of all, what Satan does is he challenges God's goodness by telling her that it's not that God says you shouldn't eat from there, it's that God is telling you you can't. So how many times when someone says you can't do something, you automatically are like, I'm going to do it anyway. You're teenagers. If you tell me you don't do that, you're probably lying. We have this, this inability to, to not be challenged. We have a word for it. Bet. Anytime somebody says, you can't do that, bet. So we challenge them, and in doing that, when we, someone tells us we can't do something, it's like we take it offensively that we have to do it. That's like I tell students, if you tell me to do something stupid, you better just expect that I'm going to do it. As long as it's not going to cost my job. But what this does is, this promotes a dependence on self and not the Savior. So we tend to say things like, I can do whatever I want. How many of us have ever said that? Or you do you and I'll do me. We're guilty of saying those things. And so it takes this goodness of God and twists it into our own goodness to where we depend on ourselves and we tell God, I'm good enough on my own. Next, he argues against God's sufficiency. He tells her, you know, if you eat from this tree of the knowledge of good and evil, basically your mind is going to explode. You're going to get to the point to where you are experiencing things that you clearly cannot comprehend. Kayla was talking to the kids today about the Salem witch trials. Yeah, kind of a heavy subject. Um, Jonah's nine and Emily is seven. So I walk in the house and they start telling me the stuff that's going on in the Salem witch trials. Like, Emily is telling me something. I'm like, that's a pretty heavy topic. There are things that we do not expose our kids to because they are not old enough or mature enough to understand it. This is exactly what's going on in the garden. Adam and Eve do not have the capacity to fully understand good and evil in the same way that God does. So in God's sufficiency, he is telling them, do not eat from this tree because you can't comprehend my knowledge. You can't comprehend what I'm doing or what good and evil is. It will essentially blow your mind. But Satan is telling them, hey, God's got a secret. He doesn't want you to know. As soon as somebody starts whispering, everybody starts listening. It's like, ooh, that's something that I want to know. That's got to be juicy gossip or something like that. And so whenever this happens, the devil is twisting God's word, saying that it's not that you can't know, it's that God just wants to keep a secret from you. God doesn't want you to know. He wants you to remain ignorant. He wants you to to know that you not know what you're doing. So Satan was getting her to reject what God was telling her for lies. It's great to know how the world works. And science does a phenomenal job of explaining how things work, at least to a certain extent. But what science will never do is explain why. We will never know why we exist. We will never know why bad things happen to certain people. We will never know why God can love us so much just from looking at empirical data. And science hates that. But the thing is, we get that understanding. We get our purpose. We get to answer or get the answers for all of these why questions from Scripture because that's where God's knowledge is. That's where God tells us. And so we, we get the scripture and we understand our purpose. We understand why we're here. We understand why bad things happen to people through scripture, not through science. It's not empirical data that we get to understand. It's something that's more lofty than that. It's called metaphysical. It means it exists outside of the physical realm, outside of the five senses. And so there are certain things in knowledge that we are not ever going to comprehend just because we are not capable of understanding it. 
And that's where Adam and Eve were in the situation. But the devil tempted Eve to go after a knowledge that she could not understand. But she did. Next, he challenged God's providence. And this basically means God's providing or protection. And he says, and God tells me, if you eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you're going to die. Now, what happens with Eve after she eats the fruit? Does she die? No, she doesn't die. I mean, at least not immediately. And so what happens is whenever she eats the fruit and she does not die, that reinforces what the devil says. Because her consequences did not come immediately as far as her losing her physical life. Now, she died spiritually, but she didn't die physically. And so whenever she didn't die physically, what happens is she's thinking to herself, maybe the serpent's right. Maybe I can't trust God. And so it reinforces the lie. Now, in life, we're going to have people, and some of us are guilty of this too, of, to convince someone else to sin because the consequences don't hit us immediately. But here's the thing. I can tell you from experience, when you have that first drink, whenever you have that first puff, the first time you go to one of those websites, the first time you tell a lie, that's going to lead you down the road to, to addiction. And it's going to lead you to a place that you never thought that you would be. It takes one drink. It takes one joint. It takes one bad decision to take you somewhere that God does not want you to go down. And you're going to wake up at rock bottom. And that's exactly what happens with Adam and Eve. They took that first bite of fruit. They died spiritually. They didn't die physically just yet, but they basically ruined everything for all of creation because of one poor decision. Lao Tzu said, every journey begins with a single step. If you think these little small things you're doing right now do not have consequences, you're just taking one step further into the other way. And those consequences are going to catch up to you sooner or later. All of these things that we do, all these decisions that they made, all these challenges that God had or Satan had to God's characteristics caused division because of pride. Because of what Satan said, Eve thought that she could believe in herself and lead her life better than God could. That's pretty prideful and arrogant. She thought she could do a better job of running her life than God could. And so she fell, Adam fell, and all of creation fell because of that. And each one of us is guilty of doing that on a daily basis. We make decisions to where we feel like we're in a better spot to dictate where our life needs to go than God is. And we're falling into the same trap of misjudging God's characteristics. Next, we see hardened bricks. We're going to transition into Genesis chapter 11 look at the Tower of Babel. So Genesis chapter 11. Let me go ahead and start reading that for you. At one time, all the people of the world spoke the same language and used the same words. As the people migrated to the east, they found a plain in the land of Babylonia and settled there. They began saying to each other, let's make bricks and harden them with fire. They, then they said, come, let's build a great city for ourselves with a tower that reaches into the sky. This will make us famous and keep us from being scattered all over the world. But the Lord came down to look at the city and the tower and, people were, and the tower the people were building. Look, he said, the people are united and they all speak the same language. After this, nothing they set out to do will be impossible for them. Come, let's go down and confuse the people with different languages. Then they won't be able to understand each other. In that way, the Lord scattered them all over the world, and they stopped building the city. This is why the city was called Babel, because that is where the Lord confused the people with different languages. In this way, he scattered them all over the world. So, everyone spoke the same language. You know, honestly, this is probably pretty cool. Could you imagine going to Japan or going to Mexico and just being able to speak and everyone understand you and then be able to speak back? It's kind of a cool thing, right? The translation gap is really weird when you're trying to understand people speaking different languages. Everybody's always like, how are you doing? Because they think if they speak loudly and they speak slowly, you'll be able to understand them better. And then everybody's just like, what are you doing? But that's, kind of, that's what we do as Americans. We always speak loud and slowly as if their hearing is bad. That's why they don't understand English. But also, it's not only that, they were moving east and decided to settle, which honestly doesn't seem like a bad thing. You know, they go from being nomadic people to building their own city. Seems like a safe thing to do with all the warring and stuff going on. Someone gets a bright idea to build a city with bricks and to build a giant tower. This will bring fame on themselves and keep them united. Clearly, God wasn't a fan, if you look at the text. He goes down, sees what the people are together and speaking the same language, and he decides, I think I'm going to confuse our language. Seems kind of like a jerk move, doesn't it? If you just look at that text out of context, it does. But they no longer understand each other and left Babel and went in different directions. So this seems like God, uh, it's a confusing thing for God to do. Here's why what he did was important. First of all, we see that this city, this tower, this area was built on disobedience. Whenever God told Adam and Eve, whenever they were created, he said, be fruitful and multiply, go 
across the entire earth and subdue it, essentially go and fill the earth. He says the same thing to Noah's family after the flood. What these people are doing, instead of going and doing that, they decide that they're going to build their own city and make a name for themselves. So them settling is being completely disobedient to what God has told them to do because they stopped spreading out. By deciding to settle in this region, they were deliberately disobeying God's command. After their descendants, the family of Noah recently saw the entire world be flooded. Now here's what's interesting about this. is This happens only 100 years after the entire earth is wiped out outside of Noah's family. So it is quite possible that the sons of Noah are still alive. And they can tell these people what God did the last time people were completely wicked and disobedient. And yet they still chose to disobey God's command. Even though, you know, a hundred years earlier, the whole earth had been wiped out. So what that shows us is, in a matter of a generation or two, an entire society can become wicked. And it shows us why it is important for us to practice our faith and to live it out instead of just talking about it. Because it can change just like that. And so this family, or this region, that was only a hundred years removed away from the entire humanity being wiped out except for Noah's family, has already dived back into sin. It was being disobedient, even though they knew that Death could be imminent. Next, it was built upon pride. We see in verses 3 and 4 that by saying to each other that they would build a tower that would reach the heavens, it puts the attention on themselves instead of God. God tells them to go out and be fruitful and multiply, subdue the earth. He gives them the command to basically be in control of all the earth. But that wasn't good enough for these people. They wanted to be in control of God. They thought that if we make a name for ourselves, people will worship us instead of worshiping God. So building this giant tower in the middle of nowhere is going to bring attention on themselves. And it's going to shift it away from God. They were out to make the rest of the world know who they were. Their desire was to take that attention from God and put it on themselves. They wanted to be remembered as a powerful people. Third, we see that it was built upon the impossible. Let's look back at verse 6. He said, look, he said, the people are united and they all speak the same language. After this, nothing they set out to do would be impossible for them. Now, this verse out of context does not make any sense because it seems like if, if people come together, they'll all get along, they all speak the same languages, they could do some amazing things, right? What are some things that if humanity united together right now, we could solve? Yes, sir. Hunger. Hunger? That's one of them. What's something else? Hmm? What? I can't hear you. How many of you ever watched the Miss America pageant? What's the number one thing they always say? World peace. peace. World peace. I knew that's what you were going to say. I can see it in your face. But they always, world peace, we can accomplish world peace. We can end hunger. We can end all of these bad things, all the wars and everything else. The problem is, as we see here and we see in Scripture over and over again, anytime humanity has the opportunity to do something, they mess it up. Socialism and communism is awesome on paper. If you look at those systems on paper, they are awesome. You know, everyone gets equally treated. The government does not have a hand in everything. But as soon as it starts getting acted out, people get killed. Entire groups get, get wiped out. I mean, if you look at how Russia handled communism, genocide happened on a daily basis. Anytime somebody disagreed with what they were saying, they killed them. They wiped them out. They removed their pictures. Go look at some of Stalin's propaganda. He would have pictures with other people in the picture. And as soon as he disagreed with them, he killed them and they removed them from that picture as if they never existed. Anytime humanity gets their hands on something, they always mess it up. Because our intentions are never godly apart from God. Our intentions are always to bring power and propriety to ourselves. Which is why this idea of them building this tower was just so detrimental to humanity. Because if they would have succeeded, the earth would not have been inhabited. They would have stayed right there and they would have maintained control and it would have been a dictatorship. And they would not have worshipped God. They would put everything on themselves. Amen, I think. <laughs> but this tower would be a testament to what they could accomplish, not to what God has already accomplished. I mean, God just got done creating humanity, just got done wiping out all the sinful people on earth, but they wanted something for themselves. The intention of it, according to historians, was to create a way for God to come to them, but also a way for them to get to God. So what it's called is a ziggurat, if you want to Google it. It was basically this ancient temple that had multiple layers. And what they would do is they had this open room at the top to where they would burn incense and they would do these chants and they would try to draw attention to a God, not necessarily Jehovah God, but a God, and bring him down to earth so they could commune with him and then also to go up into the heavens, so to speak, so they could be on his level. 
That's what they were trying to do. They were trying to become gods themselves. And God was like, no, I ain't having that. But they were operating under their own terms to get to God. This was not God's desire, so he stopped them. We cannot operate on our own terms and get to God. It does not work that way. That is not how Scripture is written. That is not how salvation was done. We operate on God's terms, or we don't operate at all. And so these people were being completely disobedient to what God was telling them to do. He scattered them in language and unity so that some of them would get back on the right track, while others continued in their disobedience and became a permanent enemy to God. Now what's interesting here is we see that this area is called Babel. Who was one of the greatest enemies of the Israelites? The Babylonians. Guess where they came from? Babel. So these people that were disobedient to God went off and became a great nation that hated the Israelites. Babel means confusion. There were some confused folks. And so this, the ones that got back on the right track, they started being obedient to God. The ones that didn't became one of the biggest enemies to Israel. So that shows you their disobedience. So you jumped me a little bit there. Um, so we like to build these monuments in our own life. We like to build our own towers. They may not be as big or as obvious as the Tower of Babel, but they are just as dangerous. So let me give you a few, a few hints here. When we decide to trust ourselves over God, we're building a tower. Whenever we make decisions without consulting God in prayer or without reading the text or getting wise counsel from believers, we're building a tower. And these things are monuments to ourselves because we believe in ourselves and we don't believe in God. And so you can add whatever else you want to. The list can go on and on. Now, God will do in our lives what he did with his tower, and he'll leave it to waste. It comes a point in our lives when we make these decisions to where we want to build all these towers to ourselves, and God's like, all right, do what you want to do. He will let you live in sin. That is a terrible place to be. Because that means there is no opportunity for salvation. God tells you, all right, you're in love with sin. Go ahead and make your choices. You've chosen hell. Now you can deal with it. And so we have to be prepared to understand that God, whenever he wants to get control of our lives, he will knock those towers down. And he will get our attention. He's not going to force himself on us, but he is going to make it very clear that he is working in your life and it's time to answer. You can't ignore God all your life and expect to get saved before you die. Believing in yourself is a betrayal of God's goodness. It's a betrayal of God's sufficiency and his providence. It's about you and not about him. One of the most important tenets of Christianity is denying yourself. That's a novel idea. That is clearly not something that happens in this generation. We do not know how to deny ourselves. If we are tempted by something, we indulge in it, and we say, bump the consequences, I'm going to do it anyway. As we have seen from believing in yourself, it can be disastrous. With Adam and Eve, it costed everyone that will ever exist after them. For the Tower of Babel, it cost them unity and understanding because they allowed their pride to outweigh the command of God. Believing in yourself is counterintuitive to the gospel. It's not biblical, or at least not positively biblical. Don't believe in yourself. Here's the deal. You're limited. Is anyone out here all-powerful? Does anyone know everything? I mean, actually know everything. Some of you might think you do, but does anybody actually know everything? Has anyone created something out of nothing? We are limited in our power. We are limited in our scope, and we are limited in our being. Guess who's not? God. That's not a rhetorical question. God. Each one of you in here is one person of 7.8 billion in the world. There are 7.8 billion, give or take a few hundred thousand people in the world. There's only one God. So why would we believe in ourselves whenever we have an all-powerful being that we can believe in that actually loves us? Because sometimes in life we can become our greatest enemy. When we look in the mirror, we can hate ourselves more than anybody else ever would. So let's transition from believing in ourselves to believing in God. Now, what we're about to talk about is going to probably sound like one of the most contradictory things you've ever heard. But that's because it's the world's understanding. It's the world's knowledge. So first of all, the Bible says that you have to deny yourself. That means you have to learn to tell yourself no. Do I want to eat that other brownie? No. Yes, Yes, but no. So Matthew 16, 24 through 26. Let me read this to you. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way Take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you'll lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? 
So Jesus does not call us to believe in ourselves, but he tells us to do the exact opposite. Don't believe in yourself. We are to deny ourselves and believe in him. Denying ourselves does not just mean giving up on a dream or giving up on a passion, but it means being ready to die. Now let me ask you this. At what point in Christ's life was he carrying the cross? When did Christ decide to carry the cross? This thing's pretty heavy. Jesus did not walk around with this his entire life. The only time he picked this up was whenever he was about to die. He was about to be crucified on this thing and die for not this one literally, but on the cross. And he was about to give his life for our sin. Now, when Jesus tells us to pick up our cross, he is not telling us, hey, everything's going to be easy. He is telling us, you are going to die. You are getting close to death. And whenever we decide to believe in ourselves, we are telling Jesus, I'm done carrying my cross. I'm going to put it on the ground over here and I'm going to start digging up this dead body that I call my flesh. Jesus is preparing us for death, death of ourselves, because we cannot follow Christ and believe in ourselves. We cannot be faithful to Christ and think that we know all the answers. We are not sufficient for ourselves. We are not all powerful, but God is. And so when Jesus says, pick up your cross and follow me, he's not saying this is going to be an easy ride. He's saying, be prepared to die because something's got to give. Either we're going to believe in Christ and we're going to die to ourselves or we're going to be willing to crucify Christ again. So you've got to take your faith seriously. We need to be able to tell ourselves no when we're tempted. Some of you are tempted by different things. The answer is no. If it doesn't line up with Scripture, the answer is no. I don't care how you feel about it. God is more, more concerned about your soul than He is about your feelings. He just said, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? Y'all think about that every time you get tempted by something. Is it willing to divulge into this sin and sacrifice your soul for it? Because that's what's going to happen. Next, he says, we've got to get out of the way. John 3, 27 through 30. John replied, no one can receive anything unless God gives it from heaven. You yourselves know how plainly I told you, I am not the Messiah. I'm only here to prepare the way for him. It is a bridegroom who marries the bride, and the bridegroom's friend is simply glad to stand with him and hear the vows. Therefore, I am filled with joy at his success. He must become greater and greater, and I must become less and less. If anyone had an opportunity to brag, it was John the Baptist. He was the one in the desert preparing the way for the Lord. He was the one preaching the message of repentance. He was the one that was baptizing people. He even baptized Jesus. How many people can say they baptized Jesus? One person. John the Baptist. Welcome to the Baptist congregation. Anyway. But he had a right to brag. I mean, he could say, I'm the one that baptized the Messiah. I'm the one that is ushering in the kingdom of God. I was the speaker that brought forth the kingdom of God. But you know what he did? He took a posture of humility. He says, I'm not even worthy to unlace his sandals. Basically saying, I'm not even worthy to touch the dirtiest part of Jesus. He showed a posture of humility. He never told anyone he was the Messiah, but that he was happy to just even be a part of what God was doing. When he says, you know, the bride is the one that goes to the bridegroom, basically he's saying that these people that I'm leading to Christ are not my people. I'm just like one of them, and I'm just happy to be here. I'm happy to see Christ working in the lives of these people and to be able to celebrate it with them. Now, if you understand John, you know that later on in the Gospel of John, he questions Jesus and says, are you the one? So this man that ushers in the kingdom even has a moment of weakness. We're going to have a moment of weakness sometimes. But it's not our job to save people. It's not our job to take Christ and carry him on our back and expect people to respond to us. Our job is just to share it. And then we get to rejoice when people repent and believe in Christ because God is working. One of the most important things he says is he must increase and I must decrease. What he's saying here basically is I've got to get out of the way so God can work. We have a bad habit, especially ministers. And I've been guilty of this too, to where we get this this big-headedness to where we think this is my ministry. This is what God called me to do, so I'm going to do it. When in reality, I told you guys this before, God can take me out in a heartbeat and put somebody else up here. He can do the same thing with every person in this room. When God calls us to do something, He is not saying this is yours, taking a run with it. He's saying, hey, look what I'm doing, and I want you to come alongside of me. I want you to be a participant in what I'm doing. And what that does is that changes our mentality. No longer is it about what I can do or what I'm going to do. It's about, hey, God is willing to use me. So I need to remain humble. 
And so we've got to be willing to get out of the way and watch God work and to be able to join him in what he is already doing. And then we can put the focus on him instead of trying to put the focus on ourselves. And so that's what John is saying here. He says, I've got to get out of the way so God can work. I've already done what he's called me to do. Now it's time for Jesus to take over. I've shared the gospel. Now it's time for the Holy Spirit to work. We can't save people. It's not our responsibility. Next, we've got to drop the burden. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10. This is probably going to be one of the craziest things you hear tonight as far as contradictory. Each time it said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now I'm glad to boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in the insults, hardships, persecutions, and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, I am strong. That makes absolutely no sense. When I'm weak, I'm strong. How much sense does that make? Any? Anybody? It doesn't. Because that's the world's understanding. But what Paul is saying here is that when I'm weak, I am strong. As in, I can get out of the way and God is going to work. In my weakness, God shows his strength because he works through me. <clears throat> Paul's going through a tough ordeal. He has this thorn in his side that's caused him to struggle and caused him to beg God to remove it. He prays three times for God to take this thorn out of his side and God says no. God's not going to do it. What this does is it humbles Paul. Because Paul just got done, you know, seeing miracles, going up into heaven, and doing all these awesome things, and rightfully so, he's probably gotten a little bit arrogant. So God puts this thorn in his side and says, I'm not going to take it out. So what he does is, whenever God tells him no, instead of this continually being a burden, he sees it as a blessing. Because he realizes that the church's growth is not his responsibility. He can't do everything. And so now he takes it off of his own shoulders and gives it back to God and says, all right, God, it's yours. And what that does is that that relieves this burden that he has on himself. Some of the struggles you guys are dealing with that you're trying to carry, give it to God. You're not going to be able to fix it yourself. The pain you're going through, the secrets you're hiding, you can't solve that problem yourself. Give it to God. He's the one that can bear that burden. Paul could see that it would not be in his own power that the church would succeed, but God's. That honestly had to be a moment of relief. Paul realized that God had chosen him, but it was still God's ministry and not his. Guess what? Paul died and the church is still going strong. It's God's ministry. It's God's people. For us, we need to be like Paul and stop believing in ourselves. We are limited to what only we can do. God is not limited and he can achieve anything that he pleases. Let me show you this quote by C.S. Lewis. Imagine yourself as living as, as a living house. God comes in to rebuild that house. At first, perhaps you can understand what he's doing. He's getting rid of the drains, right, and stopping the leaks in the roof and so on. You knew that these jobs needed doing, and so you're not surprised. But presently, he starts knocking the house about in a way that hurts abominably or hurts tremendously and does not seem to make any sense. What on earth is he up to? The explanation is that he is building quite a different house from the one you thought of, throwing out a new wing here, putting up an extra floor there, running up towers, making courtyards. You thought you were being made into a decent little cottage, but he's building a palace. He intends to come and live in himself. God doesn't want you to believe in yourself, which invokes pride and self-defendance. He doesn't want you to carry the heavy burden or to build your own towers. He wants you to believe in him. He wants you to deny yourself and trust in him, get out of the way and watch him work, and then join him. And finally, to drop the burden and let him carry it for you. When Christ told us of salvation, it was not to improve yourself. It was not a self-help lesson. We have entire bookstores dedicated to self-help. That stuff does not work. Statistics have proven that everything that they were trying to fix is still just as bad, if not worse. It is not about self-help. The Bible is not about self-help. It is about death to self. It is about denying your flesh. He came and died so that we would die to self and be reborn in Him. Let Him wreck the house that you have built for for yourself and build a palace. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this evening. I thank you for who you are. Lord, I pray that you would work in every heart that is in here. Lord, that you would prevent us from believing ourselves and actually believe in someone that can actually do something. Lord, I pray that we would put our trust in you if we have not done so tonight. Lord, it's a difficult thing getting from believing in ourselves to believing in you because it means we have to deny ourselves and some of us have to die to ourselves. But Lord, I pray that those that have not made that decision would do so tonight. We are not guaranteed another day, another breath. You've told us that today is a day of salvation. So I pray if anyone is feeling the conviction of the Holy Spirit tonight, Lord, that you would give them the boldness to move. Lord, give us the strength to deny ourselves and follow you. Let us pick up that cross and never put it down and always be prepared to die. Thank you for showing us the way and for giving us someone that we truly can believe in. 
In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.